2021 will be the year Thesisgate comes to a close. We have obtained hard proof that Tsai Ing-wen was teaching part-time at Tzu Chao University in 1983. The presidential office has yet to respond to our findings, even though we ask them to in our show each week. Instead, national security organizations started claiming Thesisgate was a movement created by China. Furthermore, the Democratic Progressive Party listed Thesisgate as its top fake news story of the year. It seems the DPP continues to wage their war on perception. However, we now hold all the cards. Tsai can continue to dodge and evade for the time being, but she can't hide forever. Someone who opts to play political chess in favor of addressing suspicions mounted against them will only draw the ire of the people. Liu Qingtian is a math teacher from Tainan City in southern Taiwan. On December 28, 2020, Liu posted a bounty on the internet offering up to 5 million New Taiwan dollars for information or pictures from 1984 that could shine a light on Tsai's education. The bounty is being offered until December 31, 2049, the same date that Tsai's teaching career documents are scheduled to be declassified. Members of the public have also marched on the presidential office to protest Tsai's degree. Those individuals offered to submit themselves to prison if Tsai presented solid proof of her education. Every Friday night, Professor Zheng Miaohong takes to Kedagalan Boulevard to protest Tsai Ing-wen's lack of a degree. More and more citizens are protesting Tsai Ing-wen in their own ways. They will not tolerate academic dishonesty at such a high level. In 2021, Taiwanese people will no longer cower under the threat of national security laws. Instead, they will stand up against lies and oppression. Proving that Tsai started teaching part-time at Su Chao University in August 1983 was a huge break for Thesisgate. Even if the University of London or the UK's Information Commissioner's Office continues to vouch for Tsai, both organizations will have to explain how Tsai taught at Su Chao University and obtained her doctorate at a school in London simultaneously. Furthermore, their explanation must be acceptable to the academic community. It's an unimaginably difficult feat. The skills of Thesisgate are tipping in our favor. Not only is Taiwan's presidential office afraid to respond, schools in London are also very careful about their next step. One wrong move is all it would take to ruin their prestigious reputations. A number of developments tell us that the University of London is currently pulling away from Tsai Ing-wen. An overseas Thesisgate investigator told us that Tsai's black leather-bound thesis in the LSE Women's Library has been pulled. If anyone requests to view the book, the library will reject the request and redirect people to the online edition. The black leather-bound thesis is the same one that the Education Ministry endorsed. Thank you.
Can the Director General of the Department of Higher Education at the Ministry of Education, Zhu Junzang, do the same now? Can he dispatch people to the school library and say that Tsai Ing-wen's thesis is there? The thesis's removal from the women's library not only proves it isn't up to standard, it also discredits the Education Ministry's claim that it verified the thesis. The Education Ministry played along with the Presidential Office's efforts to lie to the people. Had it acted sooner or later, then this photograph couldn't exist. The London School of Economics and Political Science quietly pulled Tsai's thesis from its shelves, marking a sudden change in their attitude toward Thesisgate. What this means is up to anyone's imagination. Thesisgate's 2021 legal battles are about to begin in both Taiwan and London. Our lawyers in the UK have almost completed the process to subpoena witness testimony. The next step is very simple. We'll collect all of the documents the presidential office presented to the public and submit them for verification in the UK. Even if one document turns out to be a fake, then we can sue on the grounds of forgery and obstruction of justice. That means everything Tsai's organization has shown better be legal and valid. The presidential office can't possibly hope to win this fight. For the new year, we'll be reviewing the evidence we have on hand. That way, we can get new viewers up to speed on the glaring issues with Tsai's thesis. There are three things to look at when examining Tsai's thesis. Valid and invalid documentation. Photocopies of documents are not legally valid. All of the documents the presidential office has presented so far are not valid and therefore cannot be submitted as evidence to the courts. Only original documents authenticated by governing bodies can be evidence. On September 4th, the presidential office spokesperson presented two memos sent to Tsai regarding her viva, one notifying her the date of her viva and the other telling her she passed it. Both of those memos have massive issues. The date on both documents are formatted incorrectly. Moreover, the memo saying Tsai passed her viva is dated earlier than the one notifying Tsai of her viva date. Chronologically, the memos indicate Tsai passed her viva before she even knew when it was going to be. That makes no sense. What's worse is that neither of the memos bear any signature. This is an even bigger problem than the photocopying one, and it brings the presidential office's credibility into question. A memo without a signature is worthless in the courts. It'd be a waste of time to discuss it at all during trial. Next, during a press conference on September 23rd, the presidential office showed a degree conferment letter given to Tsai in 2015. The letter was signed by the University of London's chief operating officer at the time, Craig O'Callaghan. It's the only document the presidential office showed that had an official signature of any kind. However, can a document signed by a chief operations officer truly replace a valid degree? Furthermore, the school's law department says that it does not have any information on Tsai Ing-wen. These are all things the University of London will have to address. Craig O'Callaghan may become a key player in Thesisgate. The Thai organization has steadily relied on LSE's online statements throughout Thesisgate. However, those statements don't prove anything. In fact, the contents of those statements have long been disproven. Valid but Legally Unfeasible Documents 
After the presidential office failed to prove that Tsai received a doctorate in 1984, it abruptly produced the 2015 conferment letter signed by Craig O'Callaghan and a replacement diploma to go along with the conferment letter. However, former President Chen Shui-bian said that those documents were obtained through improper channels. Those documents may be valid, but they are by no means legal. That's bad news for Tsai Ing-wen considering they are, so far, the only valid documents presidential office spokesperson Xavier Chang could produce. The presidential office is hesitant to bring any of its evidence to court. Forged and phony documents are the reason why simple academic dishonesty has escalated into a full-blown international scandal involving the University of London. External Examiner Records whether or not someone has a doctorate should be a simple yes or no matter. However, things aren't so simple in Tsai's case. Academic dishonesty is nothing new to the world. The academic circle has long had measures in place to detect scholastic fraud. If a case of academic dishonesty is backed by forged documents, then there is still one area that can serve to verify a degree's authenticity doctoral candidate viva records. That includes all information pertaining to a PhD candidate's external examiners, viva outcome, and final evaluations. Saif Gaddafi's 2011 academic scandal at LSE did produce detailed records on Gaddafi's viva. The school publicized Gaddafi's examiners' names, and that was enough to lend credence to the authenticity of Gaddafi's degree. It's easy to forge documents, but it's near impossible to fake a viva. According to a response the University of London trustees gave the reporters, Tsai's viva took place on Sunday, October 16, 1983. As for Tsai's examiners, well, the UK's Information Commissioner's Office claims that disclosing that information would result in damage and distress to Tsai, so they refused to give an answer. There is no further information regarding Tsai's viva. Tsai claimed that a photograph in her autobiography was taken in London around the same time as her viva. We proved the photograph was not taken in London, but rather in Boston, USA. American independent journalist Michael Richardson has long looked into the identities of Tsai's examiners. He is currently engaged in administrative action with the UK's Information Commissioner's Office. The UK's administrative court will process Richardson's case before February 2021. Thesisgate is steadily progressing in 2021. However, it looks like the first decisive blow may be struck in the UK. There may not be much left authorities in the UK can do to stop Thesisgate. However, Taiwan is also on the precipice of realizing the truth. In the past, whenever people questioned Tsai's thesis or degree, Tsai's organization was very quick to respond. They could easily muddle the truth and close holes in their stories one at a time. However, when faced with the truth about Tsai's time at Suchow University in 1983, Tsai's organization could offer nothing. They could only recite LSE's old statements over and over and call Thesisgate fake news. The ugly truth is catching up to Tsai Ing-wen like a landslide. Tsai's firewall will exhaust itself in 2021. Moreover, Tsai's legal inaction betrays her biggest fear. Tsai was the one that filed a defamation suit against her naysayers. She even handed the case to the presidential office's trusted prosecutor, Huang Wei. Since then, it's been over 500 days. Prosecutors have yet to investigate Tsai's case. On average, criminal investigations take 52 days to complete in Taiwan. Tsai's case has stalled for 10 times that duration. Tsai can't afford to let the case go to court because she can't let the courts see her evidence for what it is, a pile of lies.
In the case involving presidential office spokesperson Xavier Chang, Judge Zhuo Yuxuan has already sent requests to obtain Tsai's student records from the UK. But Taiwan's foreign ministry has blocked those requests. The other thesis-gate-related cases in Taiwan's high court are also tied up in administrative red tape. There has been no progress as they are undergoing evidence investigation. If any of these cases continue, then it will trigger a chain of events that will surely result in the declassification of Tsai's career documents, which will unravel Tsai's charade. Chen Ru刚刚 如果遇到了行政的救济或者是遇到司法的诉追那只要是相关的救济机关司法机关来调卷的时候，都进入司法诉讼管理cases，还需要进行一个评议之后，才能够解封吗？这种违法过决的解释背后，又藏着什么样的秘密呢？The story goes that Tsai began teaching at NCCU in August 1984. That would match up with the claim that she passed her viva in London in October 1983. However, we've already uncovered that Tsai was teaching at Su Chao University by August 1983. That revelation has renewed public suspicion around Tsai. Most likely, Tsai classified her career documents to hide away early details of her teaching career. Furthermore, Tsai's decision to classify her career documents until December 31, 2049 is not exactly logical. First, the Education Ministry says it won't publicize classified information, yet it also selectively reveals certain pieces of said classified information. 把它相关可能涉及到个人各自的部分，这我们是经过我们内部的行政的程序。最后签字是谁？我们是经过内部行政程序的。他不敢讲。These internal administrative processes the education ministry refers to are actually presidential orders. They colluded with the presidential office to formulate an entirely new teaching history for Tsai. The classified documents would contain detailed information on Tsai's teaching career where and when she taught at certain establishments, what year she became an associate professor, and when she became a tenured professor. It would also include information on her research and course history. The documents Tsai sealed away would include a diploma, academic transcripts, a thesis, publications, a lecturer's license, an associate professor's license, a professor's license, size appraisal evaluations, and additional teaching and service records. Lecturer, associate professor, and professor licenses would document where and when Tsai taught. Licenses and license numbers would be immensely difficult to forge due to their unique nature. Furthermore, there is no need to classify licenses. But why is it that Zhu Junzang could hide Tsai's lecturer's license while publicizing her associate professor's license? That seems like something that had to be authorized by higher powers. Sigapovan 
，它有涉及到行政运作以及个人安全隐私的资料是是可以持续的做保密。所以我们过去其实超过三十年，哦，三十年保密时间到，其实我们是在续，在续于保密。所以我们针对送审资料都持续保密当中。Here's the problem. Tai's documents were classified on July 19, 2019. The classification period will last until December 31, 2049. That's a period surpassing 30 years. Let's say Tai's documents were classified for the first time on July 19, 1984. A 30-year classification would end on July 19, 2014, meaning another 30 years wouldn't end until 2044. There is no logical reason why Tai's teaching documents would suddenly need to be reclassified on July 19, 2019. That is, unless the education ministry suddenly decided to do so to hide something. If these documents contain private information, then there's no need to reclassify them. Private information cannot be publicized anyway. Zhu Junzang is bombarding us with lies. One of the three scholars Tsai Ing-wen is suing is Professor Emeritus He Defen. Unlike Dr. Dennis Pang, Professor He has been indirect in her discourse with Tsai. He has set her sights on the Education Ministry. He filed an administrative appeal last year alleging that Tsai's documents were wrongly classified. He's first appeal was dismissed by an appeal committee. In 2021, she continues taking administrative action. The appeal committee should be an independent and impartial body. However, their decision to dismiss her's petition was exactly the same as the one the education ministry gave. The appeal committee cited the education ministry word for word. National law states that document classification periods cannot exceed 30 years. Why do we need such a law when administrative bodies clearly can't be bothered to enforce it? In their dismissal decision, the appeal committee acted like they knew nothing about Thesisgate. They just used the same words as the Education Ministry and said that the Ministry did nothing wrong. The Education Ministry is the one endorsing a 2019 digital document as a legitimate thesis from 1984. The appeal committee dismissed Hu's petition on grounds set forth by the Education Ministry and the Presidential Office. Appeal committees are mechanisms for the public to keep government institutions accountable, but when those committees take their direction straight from the institutions they should be monitoring, then the people no longer have a voice. The president is lying to the people. Appeal mechanisms are then interpreting those lies as gospel. Do these appeal committees even need to exist anymore? Thesisgate once again exposes flaws in Taiwan's society. As He gets ready to file for administrative action in 2021, personnel changes are being made. President Tsai appointed Wu Minghong to head Taiwan's Administrative Supreme Court, effective December 31, 2020. Wu is Tsai's cousin-in-law. He is the husband of former Labor Minister Ling Meizu. This sudden personnel change ignited a new wave of discussion. Taiwan Jury Association founder Jerry Chang said that Tsai's appointment was a prelude to constitutional infringement. Chang called on Tsai to rescind her decision. He also said that administrative matters should be handled by normal courts in order to avoid conflict between judges and the precedents they set. 
Former legislator Ling Zuosui also criticized the move. His problem isn't with the fact that Wu is Tsai's cousin-in-law. Lin's issue is that the head of Taiwan's Supreme Administrative Court is decided jointly by the president and Taiwan's judicial head. Wu Minghong took office without issue on December 31, 2020. The Supreme Administrative Court is an important mechanism by which the public can hold officials accountable. It's also where unruly civil servants go to be punished. Just when you think Tsai should retreat in shame, she installs her cousin-in-law to the top of the Supreme Administrative Court to instead show fangs. Wu's appointment is the last piece of Tsai's firewall against Thesisgate. As public sentiment shifts against her, Tsai clings to power. She shakes off her critics and even preemptively strikes down administrative action. Tsai is telling civil servants that she is not to be trifled with. Liu Jianxin is still at the examination yuan, removing documents that could implicate Tsai. Zhu Junzang is at the education ministry forging and classifying documents in Tsai's favor. Minister of Foreign Affairs Joseph Wu continues to put pressure on the University of London. National Security Council Secretary General Wellington Ku continues to paint Thesisgate as a movement conjured by China. Finally, Wu Minghong is at the Supreme Administrative Court putting pressure on civil servants. Tsai is mobilizing the entirety of the government to cover up her own scandal. If anything, it proves just how afraid of Thesisgate she truly is. Those that calculate and deceive never rest well. Thesis Gate has grown in scale after a series of never-ending lies. The black leather-bound book, claiming Mr. Michael Elliott was her advisor, a Sunday Viva, saying three school libraries lost her thesis, declaring she obtained one and a half doctorates, her time at Suchow University. These are all details that will catch up with Tsai and bury her. Tsai can erect her firewall, but that won't protect her from the inevitability of truth.